this is a very challenging subject. Challenging in itself because of the very size of the subject. I think, to be honest, to approach this subject uh, in a very holistic way, to do it real justice, we would need to look at every aspect of prayer. We need to look at the reason for prayer, uh, the example of prayers in Scripture, the different um, occasions they come up and what people are praying for. But we do not have that amount of time. Okay? So uh, perhaps our discussions afterwards will also reflect around some of those things. Except also that this is quite an emotive subject. Um, the Lord Jesus Christ died the most horrific death, didn't he, upon a cross so that we may be saved. And so it is difficult to approach this subject without a level of emotion in it. Plus also it is a particularly wonderful blessing that we can speak to our Heavenly Father as well. What I would also say is that during this study of this subject, my own views on it have been challenged on a number of occasions. Um, and where I will end up, which will come quite clear, my opinion of it, and I accept that that is open for discussion and is not absolute, my opinion of it is still a position where I believe that I will be challenged in the future of, because it is a difficult and emotive and challenging subject. But before we start, really a bit of a disclaimer in a sense, that I don't know where you sit on this, in the audience or listening in, I don't know how you feel and how strongly you feel about either way, about whether it is an acceptable thing to pray to Jesus. But I do accept that it is an emotive subject and one that is held on all sides of the camp, very dear to people. And so what I want to get across right at the beginning is that as brethren, it is good, and brethren and sisters, it is good for us to dwell in unity on such things. And I've just got a couple of things. This is, this is obviously... Uh, from Isaiah and what we know from this is what we have to accept is that there are some things that although we have a partial understanding of them because they are if you'd like the purpose and the plan of an infinite and most majestic God we don't always fully know and hence one day we will look in the mirror where we see dimly now and see very clearly won't we? Um, this is a quote from Brother Alfred Norris and it is from a writing in 1985 particularly about this subject and I think it's most useful. You can read it. But what Brother Alfred Norris says, and there's more to it than this, is that actually, look, no matter what we come at this for and how we come at it, there is something that we need to be very careful about in this subject, as there is in every subject in Scripture, and that is our own emotional approach to it cannot be a tug of war for what is right or wrong. There is one absolute truth, and that is the Word of God. And that's what we must remember, even if we fail to fully understand that Word. Uh, and uh, I think this is important. It is, isn't it, our blessing to seek these things out and uh, to discuss these things. I would say that we had that in our reading a little bit. There are these comments in Philippians chapter 2 about being like-minded, being in unity about this, about having no strife or contentions. But interestingly, that section ends up with the point that is absolutely clear, that we are to hold forth the word of life, that that if you like, is the foundation for our thinking and our understanding on any matter, this matter included. Um, and that's why the subject is titled a Scriptural Analysis, because that's what we're going to look at this evening. So what we're going to do tonight is look at the office of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I use that in phrase. I what is the Lord Jesus to us now? And, and we're not looking at it in detail, we're looking at it in headlines, all right? Um, because of time, and I warn you now, this is a whistle-stop tour. There's so much to get through. Okay. We're going to look at Jesus in the image of the Father, uh, the, humil the humility of Christ that he shows in his life, um, and particularly that humility to God, yeah, and his utter reliance on his Father. The fact that we need to look that there is one mediator between God and and man. And then because we have no other place where well, we do, we have one other which will come last, but because this is the way that we do all or should base all of our actions and things that we do, is we've got to look at the examples of the apostles. How did they pray? What was their prayers about? What manner did they address them? And then we need also, and um, most importantly, to finish on understanding what the words of the Lord Jesus Christ were in this matter. So, the office of the Lord Jesus Christ, and, and I 
I make no apologies here about the whistle-stop nature of this. I'm sure it will come up in discussion afterwards. These are just a selection, <coughs> if you like, of headlines, of comments about the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Christ the Lord. He, is, he sits on the throne of his father David. He is a king. Um, interestingly, you know from Zechariah 9, which is quoted in Matthew 21, he was king then. Behold, thy king cometh, is what they say as he goes in to Jerusalem. The angels of God are to worship him. And he has a more excellent name than those angels. Uh, it goes on to say in verse 4 of Hebrew 1. The Lord Jesus himself said to his disciples, You call me master and teacher and Lord. And, he, and, and basically saying, and you're right to do so. But he then humbles himself in, before his brethren to wash their feet. But he says to them, yes, I am master and teacher and I am your Lord. And we have to recognise him like this. In my own life, I think sometimes I have a, and I don't know if anybody else feels like this, but I have a fear about elevating the Lord Jesus Christ in the sense of what I don't want to do is get anywhere close to putting him and God, and God and him as the son, is anywhere in inequality or as the same, <laughs> yeah, as is the doctrine of some other establishments. I'm so fearful of that that perhaps I've failed in the past to recognise his elevation now in our lives and what that should mean to us. Uh, you can see the Isaiah 11 there. You're ahead of me. I'm sure you have read that. Now this, the next one comes from Philippians 2, which we read. That he has now given a name that every knee is about him. Okay? Um, and Hebrews says that in these last days, in the times from him to us, God has chosen to speak and to show us by pattern and example through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and has translated us, as it says in Colossians, unto the kingdom of his dear son. So what we get there is a lot of headlines, don't it? They say, look, here is God's elevation of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is where God places him and where we need to accept that he is in our lives. That is where he is. This is backed up. Yeah, when we consider that he is the image of the Father. So John 1, which I, I accept, is a, is a passage that needs amplification in itself. But he is described there as the only begotten of the Father, and he has that glory as the only begotten of the Father. And he goes on in John to say, look, if you've seen God, then you've seen me. That, that's how, how well I manifest. That's in my life, how I have outlived his character. <laughs> Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, and the Hebrews writer, again, we could have taken Hebrews 1 as our reading, couldn't we? He'd be in the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person. And we know the only true God. And we know eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ, through God and Jesus. And Thomas, when uh, faced with his resurrected Lord, says, my Lord and my God. Now I acknowledge that the word there in the Greek that's used for the Lord is the word phios, uh, and it can be used of a magistrate, a prince, not... God in heaven, but the fact that he elevates it, my Lord and my God. So if we were just to take those two sections for a moment, then what we would think, wouldn't we, from a, a, uh, an understanding that the word and God through his word elevates the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of our emotional connection to the Lord Jesus Christ and recognition of what he's done for you and I, and that passage in Philippians, we would prostrate ourselves and pray to him. But in any argument, any discussion, there are two sides, aren't there? And there's a counterbalance to that. Okay? And the counterbalance comes particularly through the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are, I could not find, and I, if, I'm happy to discuss this afterwards in, in open discussion or out of I could not find an occasion when the Lord Jesus Christ elevates himself to a position anywhere near equal to God or above God. He accepts yeah, that he is not <coughs> in the same position. More than that, he accepts that for his own salvation, yeah, he accepts that God yeah, is, is all in all and above him. His head, as we will see in a minute, that Corinthians tells us very clearly. So just pick up a couple of things there. He learned obedience. If he was equal to, there's no obedience that is required, is it? And, he, and, and talking about his own self, he said, I'm straightened. These things will come upon me. 
yeah, so that I can accomplish it. That, that's what will happen to me. That passage from Philippians that we read, of no reputation, in the form of a servant, he humbled himself, he became obedient, even unto the cross as we read on. And very importantly, when talking uh, to those who were listening to him during his ministry, he says, there is none good but one, talking about the Father. I am not that. And this we get a balance to it in the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's that quote from 1 Corinthians. And he absolutely acknowledged that God is his head. Yeah, and the Lord's prayer is that way. When he teaches us to pray, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus Christ says, this is a, a pattern of every prayer. Our Father, his and mine. And that's the pattern that he teaches you. A full acknowledgement yeah, that when he is upon the cross, he knows that he must commend his spirit <coughs> into the hands of his heavenly Father. Um, and I just want to touch on this as well, in the fact that in that humility there is an understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ and his reliance on God for his own salvation and resurrection. So, um, this passage from Luke here talks about him being perfected. Um, he says, Behold, I cast out demons, perform cures. He's talking about his death, isn't he? Today and tomorrow, and then the third day I am perfected. So he's going to die, and then the third, he's talking about his resurrection. On that day, he will be perfected. And, and as we've seen, he's refused to call himself good. Okay? We know he is yet without sin. And although we speak of his perfect life, and that's absolutely right to do so, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I'm not yet perfected. God is perfect, isn't he? But I am not perfected, is what he says. Uh, and this was only to, the, the process of this was only to be achieved through the cross. That um, uh, verb is only used uh, four times. So come to Hebrews chapter 2, please. Okay. Um, so here you go. These are the three other occasions it's used. It's used there in Luke, and it's used solely three times in the uh, the and the writings to the Hebrews. So we're just going to quickly look at these. Verse 10. And, and, and interestingly here we get a similar language to what we read in, um, uh, in Philippians, didn't we? For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect, and that's the same verb, through suffering. So he was perfected, made perfect, through his own sufferings. And remember, we've already looked at that he had to learn obedience by those <coughs> sufferings. Come forward to the fifth chapter. You can get there before me. Mine's not going there. Come on. Mm -hmm. There we go. Uh, and verses 8 and 9. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. There we are again. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey. And then the last one is there in the seventh chapter. And at the last verse of that chapter. For the law maketh men high priests, which have affirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. That word consecrated is the same verb. Uh, better, and if you've got uh, an AV in the margin, you'll see it, it translates it as perfected, and that would be uh, a much better translation of, of the verb. Oh. There is the occasion with Simon Peter when trying to teach Simon Peter a lesson about who he is and his heirship, if you like, that he is the son of God and the heir to the kingdom. He tells Simon Peter, when he's been asked about whether he, he, his master pays the temple tax, and after a discussion to go, doesn't he, and, and, and uh, catch a fish, basically. He'll bring up a fish, and in it he says there will be a coin, and that coin is, is, is enough for both of their temple tax to be paid which is what they're asked to pay at the beginning. And notice he says, for me and for you. Fully understanding in his humility that he needs to be saved as well. Uh, and he acknowledges that when he says, before the cross in the garden of Gethsemane, thy will be done. And not only is this about the fact that he is going to go to the cross, it's an acknowledgement yeah, that he must be obedient and subject to the will of the Heavenly Father um, for salvation to take place. So what we then begin to get, if you like, is we've got already seen very briefly two sides that we could say, well, we're in balance a little bit, aren't we? 
that what we have here is the, is the elevation of the Lord Jesus Christ, his role and purpose in our lives as saints on this earth now, and the hope of our salvation. And yet on the other side, he does not want to be elevated to that place and recognises it's not right for him to be elevated in that. And so we begin to get a little bit of uh, a balance. But what we haven't done yet is we haven't looked at the example of scripture on this. And we haven't looked at the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before we do that, let's just look at one other passage, which I think moves the balance to one side of the equation, if you like. And that is if we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ as a mediator. Again, another subject that could be a number of Bible classes all on its own and requires amplification more than I am willing to do or have time to do this evening. There's where that comes from. It's 1 Timothy. We, we, the verse is well known. And, and uh, in 1 John 2, he is described as an advocate. In John, though, he does say, my father is great and nice. So you see what I mean again? What he's saying is, no, there is an order here, the order that's picked up in Corinthians, that Christ is the head of man, but God is the head of Christ. And then and picking up Corinthians again, he says, son must be subject unto the father. Now, I accept that that is speaking about when he has put all enemies under his feet and God will be all in all. But there are plenty of verses we could go to where we see that outworked in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm sure some of them might come up in discussion. What astounded me, is, and I didn't realise this as well, is that how many times in the letters, uh, the epistle letters, uh, and through the period after the, the book of Acts, how many times that it is stated that there is either love or mercy or greetings or grace from... Yet God and Jesus, okay? And the order is emphatically clear. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll pick this up in another way in a minute. Those are all the places that that comes up. And it is always in that order and never the other way around. Not ever. Um, this is from Hebrews chapter 8. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand at the front of the majesty in the heavens that's Hebrews 8 chapter Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 so what we're told is that Jesus sits at the right hand of the throne of God 17 times it talks about where the Lord Jesus Christ is now <coughs> yeah, outside of the gospel record in the New Testament on all 17 occasions yeah, the Lord Jesus is at the right side never on the front it's always at the right side he places himself in a position that puts God very much as the head. So let's look at some of the apostles' example. So did the apostles pray to Jesus specifically? I think it's a reasonable question to ask. Um, because it's our subject, really, isn't it? Well, perhaps there is an occasion in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. So let's just go there. We'll just pick up the verses 8 and 9, which is where this comes from. I'm going to suggest to you that that's not what's happening here. There is something else happening here. All right? So, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice, he says in verse 8, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities and the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay, so what we get there, don't we, is Simon is, is Paul, sorry, praying for someone to be taken away three times, it would seem, yeah, and him being answered that way. But that's not in the context. You come back to verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. And then goes on to talk to us about one of those visions or revelations. Uh, and the context is in that form that actually what is here is not prayer, but a vision or a revelation. Not the same thing. And um, this is another place that is sometimes used as evidence for being able to pray to the, the Lord Jesus. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay? And I, I can see why. And, and what I want to make absolutely clear here is that there is a difference between praying to Jesus and thanking Jesus in prayer. Very different things. Acknowledging 
the position, the office of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives now, acknowledging this work of salvation that he has placed should be part of our prayer. Doing it publicly is quite hard. Um, but we shouldn't be fearful of that. But this is not about praying to Jesus. This is an expression of thanks. The same expression is used of God yeah, in the New Testament, thanking him for different things over 20 times, and not one of them is a prayer. Um, and another one that I thought um, that is also uh, an understanding perhaps in my own head that I had about you know, to pray to Jesus is even so come Lord Jesus. But again, in Revelation 22, if we were looking at the context of that, what we have is in Revelation, the Lord Jesus saying that he is going to come. Three times he says it, I come swiftly, I'm coming. And this is an expression of the hope and the desire of the saints, not a prayer. Even so, come Lord Jesus. And we'll see that when Jesus is invoked in the book of Acts, <coughs> that this is the same. These are all the occasions. I'm not too sure about the, the 14th verse in the 10th chapter of, of, of whether that's even in the same context of the others. And if you want to look at that, we can discuss that afterwards. It's not so. But in all the others, definitely an individual is speaking to the Lord Jesus Christ. And these are sometimes used. Yeah, as an idea of, um, of prayer. Just come, let's just go to Acts chapter 7. The ones in blue, by the way, give you a clue that that's where I'm going to be going. So Acts chapter 7, and let's just go and have a look at this. Okay, so here we are in verse 59, uh, and we're in the place, and uh, this is the March Stephen, isn't it? And it says in verse 59, and they stone Stephen, and calling upon God... It's the word fear, by the way, that's used there. So it can mean Lord as well. Um, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And, and that could be, couldn't it, interpreted or suggested as being praying to Jesus. But actually, look, if we just go back to verse 54. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, they gnashed on their teeth. And he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. This is another occasion, as is every occasion, yeah, in the book of Acts, of the Lord Jesus Christ's response to a or the individual's response to a specific revelation of the Lord Jesus. I can't see in any of those that it's not that way. That he is there in the personage, if you like. Yeah, this is a revelation, a vision. And, and just to take the context and to be consistent, if we were to go back into the Old Testament, to all the visions and the revelations that we have in the Old Testament, which all use the same language, we do not believe, do we, that Daniel is in prayer. We believe what he's seen is a dream or a vision or a revelation. And that's what I'm suggesting to you is actually happening in every single one of these. This was, I thought, was really interesting. I have always, since I've been in truth for 21 years now, prayed through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and because I was taught that way, because it's what I understood before I did this subject as being the right way, it may be what I understand still, you'll find out in a minute. But I was really surprised to find that there are, I think there's 30, but I've um, got 29 verses up here. Petition to the Father where the name of the Lord Jesus Christ <coughs> is not mentioned outside the Gospel records. The example of the Apostles is they prayed, 29 verses here, to God, not through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So direct to him. Uh, this is really for a discussion point. But let's just go to the Romans 10 one. We, we might not get time to go to all of these. I'm conscious of leaving opportunity for discussion. And, and just first one. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Not if we would read that. I'm not saying that we have got the schematics of how that prayer was given, yeah, or the language used in the prayer, but it is, it is communicated this way as a prayer to God and no mention of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, come to the uh, Colossians record. Let's just pick up another one. Okay, giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. 
who has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. We had that the end of the, the second of those two verses earlier, didn't we? Um, so again, now you could argue that this is just an expression of thanks again, just a bit like the Lord Jesus Christ. I can do, I can accept that fully. Um, but it could also be that this perhaps is a prayer when we look at the body of evidence. Come to two Thessalonians. And let's have a quick look at that one. This is in the context of prayer here. Okay? So here's that, that uh, quote that's at the beginning of all the epistles in verse 2. Look, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Note the order. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet because that your faith grow exceedingly. Um, and if you come down to verse 11 of the same chapter, wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling. If you feel all right. Now, I accept that the schematics, if you like, or the, or the structure of how that prayer is put together, we're not told. But what we are beginning to get is uh, a number of, of occasions when the prayers are to God. And let's just do the 1 Peter 1 then for the end. We could have picked any of these at random. It's just the structure of my talk, really, I picked them this way. Verse 17, again, definitely in the context of prayer. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judges, so not about the context, just the phrase, and if you call on the Father, not if you call on the Lord Jesus Christ, not if you pray to the Lord Jesus Christ in any other context of any of those that we don't, I accept we don't know the structure of those prayers, but we are told that the emphasis is to call unto God. Yeah, to pray unto God. Okay? Well, what other example do we have? Well, the petition to the Father, prayers to the Father, petition to the Father, that are definitely and specifically through the Son. Uh, Romans 1. context again is correct. First, we won't look at the second part, the first part. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Very clear. Petition to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Ephesians chapter 5. Um, and I do accept we are whistling through this um, because of our time, really. If anybody wants the slides from this evening, they will obviously it will be in video, but I will make them available on a PDF or I can send them to you as, a, as the PowerPoint in which they are. Um, so Ephesians 5, and if we're there at verse 19. Now, yeah, Barnaby did this at our praise evening the other day. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Uh, Colossians, and then we will go to Hebrews, okay? <coughs> now, perhaps not, and could be argued not in the context of prayer. Personally, I think it is. It could be argued it's not. So I just want to put across <coughs> that the evidence here is the, is the same again. So verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed... Okay. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving <coughs> thanks to God and the Father by him. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13, please. <coughs> so we're talking about our hope talking about <coughs> the fact that we look for something that is eternal uh, as the verses before tell us uh, verse 13 for example for we have no continuing city but we seek one to come by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice and that him is the Lord Jesus Christ in the context let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that is the fruit of our lips given thanks to his name again you can argue that the, the context might not be directly about prayer but we do don't we um in prayer, give thanks and offer the service of our lips, if you like, to God. But come down to um, verse uh, 20. Now, God of peace, that brought again 
from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our sheep, for the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and glory forever. And the context here continuously is that it is all to the glory of the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether we argue about whether the context is directly about prayer or not, the context about in word and deed, as we saw from earlier, and everything that we do is that way portrayed and communicated to us in the scriptures. There are a number of other places we could go. There. But more importantly, and for us to get to finish so that we have some time for discussion, we need to look at the command of the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, because that is where the apostles base their foundation and understanding of how to pray. And we really get this from the 14th, 15th and 16th chapters of John. So this is John chapter 14. It comes up again in the next verse actually, but just so that we didn't have every verse up here. There are seven, there are seven occasions that this comes up in those three chapters of John. Whether that number is significant, it says, whatever you shall ask in my name, that I would do. That for now these are the, these chapters are, as we know in context, the Lord talking to his disciples and praying uh, to God yeah, for his disciples, aren't they? Uh, but these are all occasions when he... So the context is around prayer and then his conversations with his, um, his, those that he calls his disciples, those that are his, his as he explains that they are, yeah, and, and his hope for them. What you ask in my name, he says. He goes on uh, in the 15th chapter to the same thing. Whatever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it unto you. Uh, and then you have it twice in John chapter 60. <clears throat> Whatever you ask in the Father in my name, and then further down, verse 26, he says, In that day you shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray that the Father for you. And there's his role as a mediator and advocate, but it is in his name that he says it. To end, I'm just going to leave two quotes in balance. Mm -hmm. Two brethren that I read about this, um, so Alfred Norris uh, is the first one, in 1985, who approach this very differently, but end up in a similar conclusion that I think you can see that I'm presenting to you. Um, Alfred Norris says this, and you can read, I will pick out uh, one bit of it for you. Basically what he has said is that the apostles followed that which they were shown yeah, and taught by the Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, that should be pretty good enough for us, really. There is, take the emotion out of it, he says. Acknowledge the relevance of Christ in your life. Accept his elevation. But the pattern yeah, is to pray yeah, through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and this is by Brother John Thomas in uh, his works a long time before, uh, Brother Alfred Norris, in 1855, in the Herald of the Kingdom and Age to Come, uh, in an April edition. And read, I'm only going to pick up uh, a couple of bits from this, so read it yourselves. But he puts across one of the most beautiful descriptions of the, the mediation of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've missed bits of it out for screen time and time, really. Um, but it is well worth reading this. It's beautifully portrayed, particularly that bit around the golden censer that's there in the first paragraph. Jesus prayed to the Father, he says, at the beginning of the third and was heard in the days of his flesh, which we've looked at, his reliance, his acknowledgement, and his dependence on God. He needed not to approach the Father in any other name than his own, which is interesting, and we need to read the article for that to be amplified out. He prayed to God, and he instructed his people to do the same. We dwell in him, he says, we dwell in them by faith, of Christ and then the hope of glory. So, the saints are to pray for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is the conclusion he comes to. He says it is both scriptural in type and substance and form and precept and we should be content therein. I think in words uh, better than I can explain to you ever what these two brethren are saying, we had in our Philippians reading. And that is we must acknowledge yeah, the elevation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And prayer is a place to do that. We must do that. That to him a name is given that every name should bow. All things. 
But the focus of our prayers are not about glory given unto Christ, they're not about prayers to Christ. As that passage in Philippians 2 ends up, it all has to be done to give glory unto the Father. So looking at the context of what the apostles did, what the Lord Jesus Christ said us, to give glory to the Father, which the Lord Jesus Christ did himself, we praise in his name, and we should follow that by praying to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, thank you. <coughs>